Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Um, well, photography to me represents uh, images that sometimes are, are not easy to um, to conjure up. So from, from that point of view, uh, if you see something and you take a picture of it, it, it it's a representation of what um, of what you're trying to possibly, in my case, write. So when I'm writing, I'm thinking in pictures. So photography in many ways becomes a part of that particular uh, model, if you like. Great. That's fantastic. Myron Edwards, uh, welcome to Shooting at Raw. Thank you for joining me for this call. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Great. For whatever it's worth, uh, take it as you will. But I don't do research before speaking with my guests. What no, I do fine. is we follow the the journey or the path or whatever it is, the, the road that you're going to take us on by sharing us how you spend your time. And yeah, really good to meet you. Indeed, yes, thank you. How's Hong Kong these days? Oh, it's um, it's all right, you know, ups and downs. Uh, actually, before we, you're in Cyprus? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Cyprus. Yeah, it's a nice sunny morning in Cyprus. At the moment. Temperature's around about, uh, just about 18, 19. Hasn't yet warmed up. Right. But it'll, but we're we're we're, um, we're coming into the winter season now, and uh, temperatures will start to drop quite dramatically. We have really, I suppose, two seasons. One one is summer, one is winter. Your spring and everything else seems to all come in that it coincides with summer. Once you get to Easter, then the temperature changes dramatically. Mediterranean, definitely. Uh, so it's a composite image. It looks like a it looks like a screen capture. Mm -hmm. uh, at the top, it says "Fantasy Bundle Two" in white lettering. Right. And underneath it, there are three book covers. Uh, one is called "Mistress of the Rock." One is is that pronounced "Skyla the Revenge"? That's correct. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then there's Julie's Odyssey, Alpha and Omega. Yeah, that's correct. It's part of a, a trilogy of books that I wrote based on um, an epiphany moment that I had a long time ago at the rocks in Petroturumio, which is the birthplace of the Aphrodite legend. You know, the legend basically is that the name Afro means from the foam, and uh, it, it actually is supposedly the link, if you like, between the Greek gods and uh, civilization, you know, put it a better better way. The story that I actually started the whole thing off was I was in I was over here with my wife before we got married. Uh, we came over to meet the family, and we decided we'd go to Petra to Romeo for um, for for a lunch. We went there and we talked about um, you know what 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 does Aphrodite mean and um, why is it called Aphrodite's Rock and I basically stand there sort of very dubious about the whole thing um, you know it's a legend it's, uh, it's what it is and, um, mm. and what happened and what happened was I saw something on the wall and it was really quite strange because I've never yet been able to find it but the thing that I saw on the wall was a poster from the Cyprus Tourist Board and the Cyprus Tourist Board had an aerial shot of the of the rock and uh, when you look at the aerial shot of the rock you'll actually can see a figure in the water so it looks like a, a female figure in the water that is if he like kicks the whole story off of how mistress of the rock came about but uh, if you go on mm. the website you'll be able to see similar to what i saw it's not the exact same image but it's similar to what I saw, and therefore that was the catalyst for the for the whole story or the journey, if you like, of the um, of the trilogy. 
So maybe context, like, you know, set the scene a little bit. Uh, how many years ago was this? Oh, um, I first wrote the book when I first came, when, when, when it first started. I wrote it simply as a Christmas present for my wife to, um, for her Aww. to open on Christmas morning. That was it. So it was a, it, it, it's a love story. Aphrodite is about, uh, it is a love story. So I wrote it just purely as a one-off, got it printed. Um, she showed it to a couple of people and they said, well, why don't you try and get it published? There was a publisher in Nicosia who I um, sent a synopsis to and he said, have you got the full manuscript? So I said, yes. So he said, well, come and see me on the, this was on the Thursday, he said, come and see me on the Monday. And by the Tuesday, we'd signed contracts and we were printing, printing the book. That's, that's, that's wow. how it came about. So, yeah, like, how did you fall into writing? I mean, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's glorious, it's romantic, it's, it's beautiful, that you're just like, well, I'm going to a, 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 I'm gonna write you a book that is just for you as a gift uh, yes. and so uh, how did you land in writing like are you a writer by trade like wh where would this come from uh, go, going back into the um uh early 70s i was a, a drummer in a band and um a, a mate of mine who used to work for hammer films he said to me we've got a friend who um works in a hospital radio and he wants some scripts and I said, well, I've never written anything in my life. What do, you, what do you mean he wants some some scripts? He said, well, look, look, we'll get together. We'll write some ideas down and see if the scripts will actually work out. So we actually wrote the, the scripts mm -hmm. for the hospital radio. And not only did we write them for the hospital radio, but we performed on them as well. So it was played, wow. for, the pa you played for the patients, basically. That's what it was. Okay. We had all this material that we had. And Phil, Phil Campbell, the guy who, who um, I was working with, he um, he said, well, look, I, I might as well send this off somewhere. So he sent it to the BBC. And first of all, we sent it to Dave Allen, and Dave Allen looked at the stuff. But he just finished the series. So there was, a, there was an issue that maybe he could use some of the material for the next series of Dave Allen shows that came up. Mm -hmm. But he also sent it to the two Ronnies. Now, the two Ronnies at the time were the biggest comic duo on the um, uh, on the circuit. And they had audiences of 30 million, you know, each weekend. Unbelievable. Wow. And we were lucky enough to get a joke on. But not only did we get a joke on, we got a joke on the Christmas show as well, which is usually the most oh, um, wow. watched one. Um, and from there, that kind of catapulted us into the into the idea of writing gags for various shows. We wrote for radio. Um, we wrote for Roy Hud on Hudlines. Um, we wrote, wrote for Weekendings, which was a satirical show, and uh, we wrote for various other various other shows. But the problem was that I was married. He was married. And it was a case of, you know, this isn't going to pay for uh, the mortgage. So right. what, what we, we had to do was to try and, I don't know, gauge what, what was the best thing. So we tried to do it freelance for a while and then it, it petered out. And yeah, mm -hmm. and, and kept doing some one-offs and things like that for the various shows. I did a thing with uh, Tracy Ullman in... Um, BBC Scotland, which was called a kick up the eighties. So yeah, I mean that, that's that's how I got into writing, if you like. Wow, that's that's a like it's a it's a long established path, I guess, or, or history of, of writing. So okay, but then why would you settle on on fantasy? Because that's a very specific kind of uh, form or a specific kind of aesthetic. And so, is it because you like fantasy, or is, did this kind of just make sense in terms of where you're living? Like, I, I can't say that I'm a lover of fantasy. I've read Lord of the Rings and things when I was younger, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you know some of, some of those type of stories. But no, I, the, the essence of the the story of Mistress of the Rock 
is purely based on the supposition that there is there's more to the rock than people see and that's what the mm -hmm. the idea is so from there it was it was a, a way of being able to develop the character and then develop the plot because I had the foundations of the story. Right. The story being that this is something that is uh, what I described as fact, fantasy, and fiction. So those three together mm -hmm. make up the, the genre, if you like, which is like the new genre. It's, it's a fact because it, there's a piece of rock that's in, in the water mm -hmm. at the Pachatu Romeo. It's a fantasy because of the legend that echoes around the actual legend of um, Aphrodite. And, it, and it's fiction um, because the characters in it are right. fictional as well. That presents itself as being a unique opportunity. Yeah? Right. So this image that you sent over says Fantasy Bundle 2. Now, is that a sales thing or is there like, what's Fantasy Bundle 1? Fantasy Bundle 2 is, is basically, because of my publisher, who is at Rock Hill Publishing in, in the States, I have this issue, unfortunately, mm. that I, my publisher is in the States. The chances of me getting books over from the States to, to Cyprus are negligible because the price of right. postage is absolutely phenomenal. So, therefore, I have to rely on marketing from the States for them to be able to sell the books, even though the books are in places um, like the bookstores in the UK as well, and bookstores generally uh, worldwide. But they're not in sufficient number for me to be recognized. I think that's, that's the best way that I can describe it. If you're in the big five, for example, you don't have that issue because your marketing and everything mm -hmm. else is all done for you and your books are on the shelves. If you're right, right. self-publisher or you're a publisher who is like me with, with James, James publishes the books, but he does it on a print-on-demand basis, which means that if right. somebody asks for the books, he'll print it, but he won't print 60 or 70 copies at a time, which is limitation, as you can imagine. Okay. Myron, uh, you're, you're the first person, let alone author, from Cyprus. So let's go on to the next photo. Yeah, sure. Well, a different vibe to this. Uh, it's uh, Seven Walking Maps of London. Okay, I'll tell you how that all came about. Mm -hmm. The reason I know Hong Kong so well is because I worked in Chinatown for six years. I was a travel agent for the majority of my working career. I was 30 years in the travel business working for airlines. Oh. I worked in travel agencies. And one of the travel agencies I worked in was a company called Jade Travel. Now, Jade Travel, you probably know of them in Hong Kong because they have, a, they have a branches in Hong Kong. But they also have a, a, a subsidiary called Upo Air. Now, Yupo Air used okay. to fly charters of Chinese people from England to China, uh, to England to Hong Kong. And okay. I, worked in, I worked in Wardour Street, which was in, in Chinatown. Now, how the maps came about was, I don't know if you're familiar with the British transport system, but in the 80s, it was diabolical. <laughs> We used to have, um, you know, underground go go missing in terms of, uh, you know, the trains wouldn't work and, and things like that. So um, one night I was stuck at Tottenham Court Road and um, I, I was looking around to, for a bus or a taxi. It was pouring with rain and I felt crushed. I've got to get to Liverpool Street. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? I've got to walk. So I walked. But I took shortcuts. So instead of going the, like the normal way that you would do from Tottenham Court Road to the city, I started to take shortcuts. And those shortcuts, when I looked mm -hmm. at my watch, I was only about 25 minutes 
into the walk by by the time I'd got to Liverpool Street. And I realised, hold on, if I can do this in 25 minutes from Tottenham Court Road, maybe it's possible to be able to do six or seven minutes from different uh, locations in, uh, you know, mainland railway stations to various tube stations. Right. Now, by doing that, people used to go from, uh, let's say they used to go from bank or, or from monument to bank. Now, monument to bank mm. is, is literally three minutes. That's all it is. But they would travel that far or they would go from bank to Liverpool Street. Now, bank to Liverpool right. Street is, is uh, 10 minutes or something like that. Okay. Now, bank to Liverpool Street would be crammed, absolutely crammed. So you'd get all these people trying to go on the, the underground for the sake of one or two stops. So my idea right. was let's try and find short distance walks where people can get, not bother with the trains, not bother with the underground, right. not bother with the buses. Purely by fate, about a week later, there's this thing buzzing around in my head. I met a taxi driver, a chap called Jim O'Brien, nice guy. And Jim and I spoke in the um, in, in the cab as he was taking me back to the uh, railway station. And I said to him, Look, I've got this idea. And he said, well, the knowledge, actually, which is the taxi driver's, if you like, Bible, mm -hmm. that will actually show you quick routes. It will show you routes on how right. to get from A to B without all the fuss and everything else. So I said, I'll tell you what, why don't you drive, draw me up, say, 12 routes, you know, from mainline stations to within a radius of, say, 15 minutes, just maximum like that. So he said, yeah, all right, I don't mind doing that. So he took my number and everything else. And I didn't hear from him for about a week, 10 days. And then he came in the office and he had all these different routes. And I thought, Blimey, you've done really well. So I had a graphic designer, a chap that I used to use, and I took it over to him. And he said, well, look, the best thing for you to do is don't take the traditional A to Z map, but create your own map. So what yeah. we did was we created our own map based on central railway stations being at the center of the map. And then the offshoots, the routes going from the central railway station. So when it came to it and you gave the directions, the directions were the same as the knowledge of the taxi driver. What I have of this, what I really appreciate is here you are, you're, you're like living your life and then you have this sort of this sensibility of being a tourist, right? From your work, putting together packages and all this stuff. And then you kind of make, you can connect the dots and then you say, oh, wait a second. Get, getting around London can be, um, you know, it's relatively well known for it being uh, a little bit tedious or slow or whatever. And so you, you, you have this entrepreneurial impulse. So the, the walking maps of London, here in the graphic, it says seven walking maps. But did you do a s series of these, or did you only print one sort of... Well, I did all the mainline stations. I started with, with Liverpool Street, Fenchurch Street, Cannon Street, and then we went across to Waterloo. Uh, we did King's Cross. We did theatre walks, which was mm -hmm. around the West End. We did Royal Walk which was around the royal palaces. And we also did a river walk as well. Are these still available? Unfortunately not, because basically the, co the company went bust. I didn't have enough money for it to keep going. I tried, mm -hmm. tried different ways of being to raise funds. I even got divorced because uh, we were, we, I wanted to get funds who actually raised enough money for us to be able to develop a company. Um, we did develop a company eventually, but not sufficient enough money. And again, it came down to, if you don't have the advertising budget, we tried out everywhere, every which way you could do, you could imagine. We, we did TV sponsorship for um, 
for a charity walk. We did that. We did printed the the maps in Filofax version. If you remember what a Filofax right, right. was like, and, and we got into several shops. London Tourist Board loved it. I and then unfortunately, um, I was looking around for um, a, a business angel. I got a business mm-hmm. angel that came up, and I said to him, "Look, we're going, we're going to need around." say 25,000 he said well that's not a problem and then I put all my eggs in one basket thinking this bloke was going to come up with the 25,000 and he went bust so there I was Uh, left with nothing okay well then the big question is for a listener today clearly making maps at this point isn't a thing making a walking tour walking maps that could be a thing but in terms of, like, what is, the, what is the lesson that we can distill from what you learned for somebody who's like, in terms of, because I really appreciate this idea of you going around and having this entrepreneurial sort of spirit to say, oh, hey, wait a second, maybe we can do something here. And as you saw, it's quite challenging. Yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah. so yeah. what is the lesson? What's the lesson we can share? Okay, well, the lesson is don't go into something unless you have the substance to be able to follow it up. Mm. You, it doesn't matter what you go into. You can't go in on a wing and a prayer. You've got to go in with substantial backing mm-hmm. right from the beginning. You need collateral, and that, above all, is, is the most important. Because when you try to right. do something on a wing and a prayer, invariably it doesn't work out because you're limited with what you can actually do then. You're limited to to the fact that you, you only have so much budget. So where do you put the budget? Yeah. And, and let's say you put your budget into an advertising campaign and that advertising campaign bombs, you've lost everything. Mm-hmm. From that point of view so if you're going into from an entrepreneurial point of view you must have the backing to be able to substantiate what you want to do right uh, if you don't then you're climbing up a hill and you're sliding back down before you even get to the top right excellent advice um seven walking maps of london the dynasty and the and the empire that could have been. Do you want to go on to the next photo? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the problem is, uh, I'm not very good with directions. And my wife will tell you, okay. I, can't, <laughs> I can't tell my left from my right. I, I am absolutely okay. diabolical with directions. How the hell I invented a mapping thing, I do not know. I really do not know. Okay. I can't tell you. Uh, it was all down to Jim doing what he could do. I gave him the I gave him the premise, but he was the guy who put it t- together. And together with the art director of that the chap, I don't know if he's still alive now, uh, because he was quite mm. he was quite old then in those days. A chap called Bob Holman. He he was very very clever, and he he was concocted the whole thing. I just came up with the idea. Well, it's great. I, I mean, and in a way, entrepreneurship is about bringing together a team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there, there is that. Yeah. Okay. Wait a second. This is very different. So it's a, it's an illustration. Uh, it's like a scorecard of sorts with this sort of illustrated lights on the left, lights on the right. Uh, there's a football a soccer ball on the grass right but the the point of the graphic is it says score time and then score eight time it says coupon betting score betting odds time live betting uh there's also a a graphic of a of a roulette wheel that also maybe some some cards yeah like a like blackjack table register now what's this okay I was a copywriter in the 80s. I was, you know, I told you I was a travel manager. Um, well, one of the yeah. travel, one of the places that I actually was a travel manager for was JWT. 
Now, JWT was the biggest advertising agent in the world at, at the time. And uh, I used to look after their travel for them. And then the guy there, he, the guy who I was talking to, a chap called Andrew Nelson, who was responsible for the Andrex campaign, the, the famous Andrex campaign with the dog and everything. He said to me, um, well, you do some writing. Why don't you do the copy test? And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, it's just a, a way of being able to gauge if you're any good creatively wise and maybe you can, you know, get a job as a creative as a creative person. So I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. He said, look, I'll tell you in all honesty, he said, no one's passed it in three years. It's really quite, <laughs> really quite difficult. So I said, yeah, all right, I'll give it a go. I did the copy test and I passed it. And, um, oh, wow. I, got, and I got taken up to the creative department to meet the creative director. And he gave me some, uh, he gave me some campaigns to do where, They'd already done the campaigns, so like for Guinness or for Kellogg's, for example. And he said, I want you to redo the adverts. So I said, yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. So I redid the adverts. And on top of that, with the, um, with, the, with the copy test that I did, he offered me a job in the creative department. Amazing. I went into JWT as a, a first of all, a junior copywriter. And within... Ten days, I'd written my first commercial, which was for um, a, a dog company called Spillers, and uh, that I was, was really enjoying that lifestyle. It was really good, but then mm-hmm. <laughs> fate always seems to ha- have a hand in whatever I do. That at that time, and it's the first time in the history of um, commercial television, ITV went on strike, uh, which meant that all the commercials that were the background of JWT, all went off air. They didn't have any revenue right. coming in for them. So we were we were reduced to just producing posters or producing press ads or magazine ads and things mm-hmm. like that. So for about a year, we were uh, clinging on to what, what we were doing. And then suddenly we all got made redundant. So I just said, oh, this is ridiculous. I've got to pay the mortgage. I can't hang around waiting to get another job in in advertising. And what with everybody else also experiencing the fact that there was no TV advertising and that. So I went back into the travel business and um, I ended up working in a merchant bank. But that's another story. But to go back to what you you were saying, how did I get involved with this particular uh, scenario? When I came to Cyprus, I worked for several companies. I worked for phone companies. I worked for um, a company that specialised in backgammon. I, I've now, I, right. I don't know how to play backgammon. All right, I've never been able to play backgammon yet. You're hired. <laughs> I used to have to write columns for backgammon. I even produced an e-book on how to play backgammon and what, what you know, the various moves that you do with backgammon and all the rest right. of it. So I produced that. So I, I, had, uh, I had a job working um, in this place, doing this play 65. And uh, around the corner from me, where I used to live, was an advertising agency. So I went in there one day and I went, so I went up to the director. In Cyprus? Said, yeah, in, yeah, in Limassol. And okay. I went up to the director and I said to him, do you have freelance, you know, copywriters or anything? And he said, well, well tell me what, you know, what, what, what your experience is. So I told him my experience and he said, well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a brief. So I said, okay, fine. So he gave me a brief and I did this brief for him, took it back over the weekend and he said, could you start working for us? And I said, well, I've got this job at the moment, but yeah, I could think I'd probably be able to just start straight away, you know, from that point of view. So I ended up mm-hmm. working working in his advertising agency, and I was... Now, you've got to remember, I don't speak Greek. I don't speak a bloody word of Greek, okay? So I was working in this agency. Now, remember, they have Greek text as well as English text. So... There I was writing TV commercials in English 
which could be translated into Greek. So everything had to be visual. Mm -hmm. So I was writing visual, visual commercials, etc. And uh, I thought the TV commercials, radio commercials, and, and, and press and things like that. And one of the things that came up was we had an idea that maybe it would be a good, good, good thing to have a a game. So mm -hmm. I came up with this like bingo idea for Burger King, believe it or not. Um, we went and saw Burger okay. King, and they said, "Yeah, okay, sounds like a good idea, but no, not for us at this moment." So I took it away and I changed it around a bit, and then it came up with the idea of score time, which was I'm trying to think of how how it the best way to explain it. Most football games, like if you're doing the pools, for example, are based on draws. You know, uh, mm -hmm. eight draws will give you the jackpot. You know that sort of thing, or right. for games that are uh, home games, if you if you predict five games and they're home games or whatever, mine was based on the pure idea of how many goals were scored, not just by one or two games, but throughout the league. So, in other words, mm -hmm. if you had a figure of say sixty goals. That would be what you wanted. That would be the target that you were looking to try and get. So we developed this game right. called Score Time, and we actually went to London to Littlewoods, the Pools Company, and uh, we mm -hmm. showed it to them, and they were impressed with what we what we had, and they asked us to do a World Cup version. So we came back to Cyprus and we started putting a World Cup version together but then we also went out to uh, Athens because the uh, main gambling organization over here is place is um, oh, I can't remember the name now they're the main gambling organization and they basically control everything and uh, we went out to Athens we came to see them and we showed them the game and they said yeah okay this seems like a a good thing. The only problem is when we came back, we found out that they liked the idea, but they felt it would be detrimental to their own Joker idea, which was um, where, where everybody used to do the Joker. Joker was very simple. This, by comparison, right. at the time was more complex. So they thought, right, well, we'll stick with what we've got. Anyway, score time, we, we put together... And we put it into a computer and we put it onto a, a website and um, people used to play it and and that sort of thing. But then, as I told you before, fate seems to, to have a hand in what we do. We, we were doing quite well as an agency and then one day I got a phone call to say, don't come in the office anymore, we're no longer in business. There's been a fire and the fire has actually burnt out everything that we've got so all our oh, wow. all our infrastructure was gone we couldn't operate so everybody was made redundant that was it oh wow that's what i mean the fate hands you that sort of thing you have to deal with it sure in an odd um okay so let's tie it back to the point of the podcast right like we're all given a limited number of of seconds of of moments of of presence time of life right and um you could say call it leave it up to fate or leave it up to uh, the gods or leave it up to the universe you know who knows what happens okay so i i love the idea that you're you're the kind of person who for better or for worse will sit there and tinker and come up with these ideas and then you know, not be afraid of going from Cyprus to to Athens to you know in Greece, and then going to London, and then trying to shop around this idea to see who's going to take it. Uh, it has some success, some failure. Yeah. So, so why don't you talk about your personal relationship to failure? How do you feel about failure? Uh, that's an interesting 
uh, question because um, I tend to feel that um, I should give in, but I don't give in. Mm. You know, I tend to think, oh, well, you've given it a good crack, you know, that, that sort of idea. But sometimes something just inspires me to say, no, look, just keep going, you know, just keep keep going. Um, and somehow I just uh, kind of keep keep the momentum going, you know, from, from that point of view. I've had so wow. many disappointments by comparison to... to mm-hmm. You know, but to, to successes, if you like, I, it's just like the, the best way I can describe it is I go so far up the ladder and then at that point I start to slide down. And that's just, that, that's it. I never make it to the actual top, but I keep trying to get to the top. That's the best sort of right. analogy that I can give you. It's, it's very easy to give up, but uh, it's hard right. to keep going. Is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think, like, how do you move? So, you know, you get this phone call saying, hey, listen, don't bother coming into the office because it's burnt down. How do you go from there to your next step forward? What were the gears that were turning in your head? Well, then you see, uh, it was a quite a case of what do I do now? The problem was because I don't speak Greek, I couldn't get into another advertising agency. So I had to have a complete change of career, completely change everything. And um, in Cyprus, it's a very financial island that we have a double tax treaty uh, agreement. And we also have, um, apart from tourism, which you can imagine is is very, very large in, in its own way. Um, we also have the, the financial advantages and we have a gaming infrastructure as well. Mm-hmm. We have Forex companies, and they're licensed Forex companies. We also have many unlicensed, un- unfortunately. But generally, the, um, the the consensus is that this seems to be the, if you like, number three in the industries uh, on the island. So Forex and, and things like that. Now, but before... I got into Forex. There's a thing called binary options. I don't know if you've come across binary options before, but binary <laughs> options was uh, <laughs> binary options was uh, was nothing more than a gaming thing. It, it basically basically was yeah. it was so simplistic it was untrue. But people lost fortunes, absolute fortunes over it. And there were a couple of, mm. uh, shall we say, dubious companies that were operating this um, operation of um, binary options. Basically, what binary options was, you had to predict a certain level of investment, whether it would go up or go down in a given time. That was that was the, that was the mm-hmm. complete essence of it. In many ways, Forex is similar, in, but much more complex. It has a, a, a different infrastructure to binary options. You also have to know knowledge of the market. You have to be able to assess if you think for a zoom since a commodity. Myron, Myron, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, Myron. I think you've lost me. What are we talking about? <laughs> oh. So I'm looking at the score time. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, 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 after, like, after, <laughs> after, score, after score time, I went into the financial world. That's what happened. Okay. Got so it. That, that, Got from, it. From, from, from okay. That, that's why. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I was just like, because I'm looking at the image, trying to get an anchor back to it. Well, look, the, these conversations really scream along. Shall we go on to the next photo? Is, is that another stage? Or do you want to continue talking about score time? Yeah, the, the book is The Two Ronnies. That's, that's what the photo okay. is. So that goes back to my, that goes back to my BBC um, connections. Um, okay. And, and, and uh, The Two Ronnies was, as I say, the beginning of my if you like, com- uh, comedy co- career. And uh, I was very fortunate. I've worked with some of the, the greats of um, of comedy. People like Mr. Bean, you know, uh, Rowan Atkinson. Yeah. 
he used to be on a, 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 a comedy show called Not the Nine O'Clock News. Now, Not the Nine O'Clock News was produced by a chap called John Lloyd. John Lloyd, who was the mm-hmm. producer on Black Adder, uh, he also produced uh, Ron the Hudlines. So that that was it. I worked with Weekendings, and there was a chap called Douglas Adams who went on to do Hitchhiker's right. Guide to the Galaxy. Unfortunately, Paul died died very young. And uh, Griff Reese Jones, who was on not the nine not the nine o'clock news, who then went on to do uh, Mel Smith. Uh, with Mel Smith, who also mm. unfortunately died young, uh, went on did Smith. Now hold on, you're you're dropping a lot of names. You're dropping a lot of names, but let me first of all anchor the. Okay, so the last image is a photo of a of a book cover. Yeah, and it's called the bumper book of the two Ronnies. That's and correct. The the double O of the word book has the face of these. I guess these guys are the Ronnies. So this yeah. is before my time. This, I'm Canadian. It doesn't really really signal very much to me, but the bumper book of yeah. the two Ronnies, the best of the two Ronnies dialogue. Yeah, this is, would be around uh, early 80s, this would be. And uh, there's a couple of gags of mine in there. If you look, uh, I've got credits in the book itself, which is why I included it in the book. There's about four or five different Ronnie books where I've gotten uh, my name in it as well as well as the, the, the TV program where we, we, we did the Christmas, uh, the Christmas gag um, on, the, on the Christmas show. And that just adds a bit more to the, to the portfolio, really, from, from that point of view. If you go right. on to Google and you look up my name, you'll see BBC Comedy Writer, which uh, you know, is, is great because I, I'm in a list of comedy writers who we've seen as being the the best in the business and it's nice to be in that company um i've just finished two kids books so i'm looking at getting the kids publisher i'd like to be able to find a kids publisher that is outside of america uh i'm working with a a mate of mine who is putting together a, a screenplay for a sort of a con man yeah we're trying to work on the script together. It's, mm. it's, it's quite complex as well. Um, I'm trying to also trying to get people interested in maybe making a movie of the, the Mistress of the Rock trilogy. Sure. But that's, that's difficult because you basically need somebody to back you, and that's not easy to find. But apart from that, I just keep myself busy. My, my problem is, of course, I have um, I have dialysis three times a week, so that that sometimes knocks me off my feet a bit, and um, yeah, so so I have to keep myself occupied as well. So in terms of your practice, yeah, so 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 let us into into your world. Okay, well, the, the, the whole essence of the, the the trilogy of the books is that it's a contemporary Greek story if you like it centers around the legends of of cyprus Mm -hmm. are mainly the aphrodite legends but there are other greek legends associated with the island uh there's also the main greek legends as well which come through in various forms in the different books from that perspective there's a lot that you can do if you take for example the modern day world and then drop the ancient world into it, you create a fantasy world of its own. Mm-hmm. But you keep a realism going as well. That, in many ways, puts it on a level because it's giving you the story from a modern-day aspect, but bringing the ancient into it as well. They run concurrently. So that, that in, it, in its own way is, if you like, the unique part of the fantasy fiction. Got it. That really tells me how I can follow on from one book into the next book into the next book. And I only originally, remember, I only originally wrote this for my wife for a Christmas present. Right. And it's now catapulted into a trilogy of books. Nice. Um, Myron, like a... 
Yeah, thank you very much. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. For sure. And I'll put the uh, the links in the show notes. Uh, Myron, listen, thank you very much and take care out there in Cyprus. Okay, take care. Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting.